Um, I would like to uh, welcome you all very much to this webinar uh, uh, presented by, uh, by BP Innovation Center uh, to present a research we did uh, that was commissioned by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and that was looking into the level of inclusiveness of public-private partnerships and then more specifically on uh, the instruments FDW and FDOV um, that have been initiated by uh, the Dutch government and are implemented by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Um, the, the outcomes that we'll present today uh, of this study uh, come from the report that, uh, that we have launched uh, earlier uh, last month and that's also available on the website of, uh, of RBO. If we then go to the, uh, so, sorry, to introduce myself, that's perhaps a, a good, a good way to start. Uh, my name is Nick van Dijk. I'm a program manager at, uh, at the BUP Innovation Center. Um, together with uh, MDF Training and Consultancy, we were uh, asked by, uh, by RVO to, uh, or Netherlands Enterprise Agency to, to, implement, uh, to implement this research. If we then go to the, to the agenda for this uh, roughly one hour that we'll have, um, we go through the following elements. Um, first, uh, I will give the floor to, uh, to Mrs. Ella Lammers, uh, Senior Advisor at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, to quickly highlight why uh, uh, Netherlands Enterprise Agency decided to, uh, to launch this, uh, this assignment and this work. Um, subsequently, we'll go into uh, um, the definition of inclusiveness that we, uh, that, that we finalized and, uh, and put up in the research and in the report. Um, and we'll have a look at what we call um, the science of inclusiveness or the five A's that we have used uh, throughout the report. And then we'll spend uh, most of our time on uh, introducing the best practices on inclusiveness that we found in both the FDW as well as the FDOV portfolios. Um, and uh, after that, we'll discuss um, also some dilemmas that uh, the projects encounter or might encounter when balancing on the one hand inclusiveness with other goals that are set for the PPP. Um, and then, uh, uh, well, last, best for the last, so to say, um, we'll have two uh, project managers from both an FDOV as well as an FDW project that, uh, um, that in an interview will explain to us uh, uh, what the projects are about and how they are aiming to, uh, to make their project more inclusive. Um, and then we'll save the last 10 minutes of the, uh, the webinar for questions and answers. And all those questions can come from you. If you look carefully in the, in the, the menu bar in the bottom of your screen, you will find a listing of Q&As. Um, you can pose all the questions that you want to ask uh, uh, there in the Q&A section. Please, please don't do that in the chat section. And um, we'll select uh, two to three questions or, or more if time allows um, that can be answered by, uh, well, either by uh, Juliette, uh, by uh, Ella or by myself. Um, so without uh, further ado, I would love to give the floor to, uh, to Ella to briefly explain on, uh, on the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, study. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar. I am Ella Lammers from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and as the implementing agency for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we implement various PPP programs. We strongly believe in partnerships where public and private partners, together with the civil society, work together to solve complex problems and jointly aim to reach the development goals. We have the... Uh, we have the uh, Sustainable Water Fund, working on access to safe drinking water, wash services, efficient water in agriculture, and integrated resource management. But we also implement the Facility for Food Security and Sustainable Entrepreneurship, the FDLV program, where partners jointly work to address food security issues and work on work and income. And we recently also started the new facility, the SDGP program, again a PPP program, which is aiming to reach various sustainable development goals. And that program now is open for proposals. And the themes are nutrition, value chain development, circular economy in the agri-sector, and work and income. And more information you can find on the website of RVO. So far, we have more than 100 projects in our portfolio of PPP projects. It's a very large portfolio addressing many sectors and many projects in different countries all over the world. 
And as the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, we believe that it is very important to learn from these projects. And the, although, although the projects are very different, they, they still face the same challenges. And one of the issues we are very interested in is how the various partnerships best reach the target groups of the PPP programs, being the poor and the vulnerable groups, farmers, SMEs, bottom of the pyramid consumers, etc. And therefore, we decided to assign this study to look at this more in detail. And we were very pleased with the offer of uh, Bob Inc. together with MDF, since they proposed not to carry out an evaluation as such, but to look for positive examples and best practices. The report has been finalized and that will be presented in this webinar. I also would like to thank all the projects that, um, for their support in this study, because we, we found that every project was very uh, eager to, to, sh to share their experiences in a very open manner, and therefore it was possible to learn from the projects. And without this open attitude of all these projects, this webinar would not have been uh, possible. So we are very thankful for this uh, response. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Ella, for this uh, for this introduction and setting the scene for uh, for this research. Um, uh, let's dive into uh, what we call uh, at least or how we have set the the definition in this research for uh, for inclusiveness. And, and and just before I start with that, it is it is good to know that for this research, uh, basically we have looked at the entire portfolio of uh, of, of both FDOV and FDW uh, uh, in depth for portfolio analysis. Uh, we took a closer look at uh, at 21 specific projects, 11 from the FDW portfolio and 10 from the FDOV portfolio. Uh, um, we also. Uh, 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 researched uh, actively the, the documentation for all those projects and um, subsequently we selected 10 uh, projects uh, of which we believed um, they had uh, the, the strongest uh, signs of, uh, of inclusiveness to better understand how that was realized and we did so by, uh, by both interviewing uh, RVO project advisors as well as the, the project managers of the lead partners in these, uh, in these PPPs. Uh, so that's how we came to, uh, to the conclusions and to the reporting that we are presenting to you uh, right now. Um, one, of the, one of the starting points of the research, and not the easiest one, was to define what we exactly mean with inclusiveness. Um, there is quite a, a, quite a diversity of, uh, of, of, of definitions that is being used by different, different pra practitioners, and it's not easy to decide what the angle is that we specifically want for this uh, research. Um, since uh, 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 the goal of both FDW and FDOV is to also include uh, the private sector in the different PPPs that are being set up, um, we have decided that um, it was good to look at the, uh, the definition of inclusive business. And um, the definition of inclusive business that is most used is the one uh, uh, coined by IFC in 2011. So that's been the starting point. Um, but we've contextualized uh, uh, their definition to, to the research we've, we've implemented. And uh, one of the important contextualizations or one of the important bases um, that we use with the IFC definition is the distinction of different roles or different groups, if you would call it. Um, so if you look at um, the definition of inclusiveness that is now shown on the screen, um, it's very clear that with inclusiveness, we mean uh, targeting the base of the pyramid. Uh, um, but obviously, and if you also look at the, the policy uh, framework for both FDOV and FDW, you see that it's very important that there is a specific focus uh, on women and other socially vulnerable groups. And, and also that the broader context of communities in which these uh, PPPs operate is, uh, is very critical. Uh, and then lastly, what we have borrowed or what we have used from the IFC definition of inclusive business uh, are these distinctions in roles. And if we look at roles that are uh, very important and that we see frequently coming back in, in the portfolios, then we're looking at the roles of small the farmers, uh, micro entrepreneurs, uh, employees and, uh, and BOP consumers uh, as well. Uh, so that's how we came to this uh, definition of inclusiveness and that has also been the basis for, uh, uh, for the work in this uh, report. Um, and if we're talking about the base of the pyramid, I mean, on the one hand, uh, as it has been coined initially in research, it, 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 it sounds like a homogeneous uh, uh, economic segmentation of uh, the economic base of the pyramid, aiming at the lowest end of the base of the pyramid. 
of, of the economic pyramid being the base of the pyramid. Um, at the same time, and also uh, uh, from research that has followed after the initial uh, uh, publication by C.K. Pralat of his, uh, his book, bottom, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, uh, uh, researchers have also dived deeper into what is uh, basically a quite a dynamic economic segment, this base of the pyramid. And they have distinguished three BUP segments according to living standards, um, which are now presented on your screen. And um, they range from poverty to subsistence to low income. Um, why it's important to make this distinction is again the fact that um, uh, where possible all the projects in FDW and FDV also work with companies. And um, if companies want to offer their products or services to the BUP, um, then there has to be a basic uh, uh, purchasing power with the consumer to actually buy uh, these products or services. Um, so that's why we're saying that it's very important to specifically look at this low income uh, uh, segment of, uh, of the BUP uh, because this is where, uh, because of the three to five dollars a day they, uh, they would live on, uh, there is some spending power that can, could be tapped into by the, by the private sector. Um, and on the right hand side, you'll see that we, we've listed again the, the roles or the, or the target groups that we've been looking at. So uh, that's employees or workers, that's farmers, um, that's BAP consumers, uh, that's micro entrepreneurs, and that's communities at large. And, and in all these, we also look specifically for the more vulnerable groups, uh, for instance, uh, uh, women and youth. Um, so uh, a few words on uh, what we call in this particular case indirect effects or trickle down effects. Um, also from uh, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency in, in commissioning the work to us, uh, they made it very clear that they would want to have a better understanding of what the indirect effects could be of, uh, of the activities that are taking place in the FDW and FDOP projects. Um, Indirect effects or trickle down effects, they also relate quite closely to the segmentation of the BUP that you saw earlier. Um, if projects also for economic reasons decide to aim for the higher end of that base of the pyramid, um, then how does that relate to the subsistence or even the poverty levels of, uh, of the base of the economic pyramid? And, and then we're talking about indirect effects. Um, so uh, targeting that higher end of the, of the base of the pyramid could make a business sense, but at the same time we have to understand what the subsequent effects or the trickle down effects are of targeting these specific uh, groups. Um, so here in this slide we've listed a few examples of how you could think about indirect effects. Uh, for instance, taking the one on the top, if we are working with a micro entrepreneur that is, uh, that is an input provider to, uh, to farmers, uh, um, then it would make sense to perhaps target uh, uh, that micro entrepreneur. But you could see trickle down effects or indirect effects coming from working directly with this input provider. And that could, for instance, be uh, uh, that that input provider is hiring uh, uh, youth. Uh, for instance, as spray service providers spraying uh, herbicides, pesticides, and other agricultural inputs as a service uh, to farmers. And, and that could be people that come more from, for instance, from a subsistence level. Uh, so that's how you could see in, in, in practice uh, uh, indirect effect or trickle-down effect from the activities that are taking place in the FDW or FDOV project. Um, we, we've been looking very carefully at the potential and, 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 and also the, the, the real effects of, these, uh, of, of, of this mechanism in the different projects. Um, we, we have to be honest that uh, this was not very easy. And one of the main reasons for that is that uh, little to no projects um, take these indirect effects into account when designing their m and &E frameworks. Um, so that basically means that, that most, if not all of the projects don't track these indirect effects. Um, so it is assumed that these indirect effects take, take place and we've seen quite a number of these assumptions also following from the examples that we mentioned here on the slide in project documentation, uh, but, but we've not been able to, uh, to get proof from project owners that these indirect effects also really take place. Um, this is not uh, uh, an uncommon thing. Um, in, the, in spring of this year, uh, uh, evaluation of the overall food security policy of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs over the past 10 years uh, had been issued. And the researchers in this, in this well, uh, serious and heavy uh, evaluation uh, also came to the same conclusion that also uh, more broadly uh, projects for in this particular case focusing on food security uh, have a very hard time in, in measuring the indirect effects. 
So it's also already looking a little bit ahead on the conclusions of this research. It, it's highly uh, uh, advised uh, to projects and also to, to potential future SDGP projects to look at the potential to, to measure these indirect effects when setting up m and &E frameworks. Um, uh, then, then if we're talking about how uh, uh, do we get to inclusiveness, how do we reach these target groups uh, and how do we make sure that uh, the products or the services or the practices that we are proposing or that we're offering through projects, how do we make sure that, uh, uh, that they actually also uh, being used by this, uh, by this target group. Um, what we've done in the research is that we've distinguished uh, eventually five A's as signs of inclusiveness. Um, we've borrowed from uh, the work of, uh, of renowned thinkers in this, uh, in this particular case. You, will, you might uh, recognize the first four A's as the four A's that are also being uh, expressed in the book by C.K. Prahalad, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Um, and you might see that the fifth A, uh, the A of Advantage, comes from uh, the publication Growing Prosperity that was issued by Acumen and Bain Company. Um, we believe that it's important in every intervention or activity that you design as a project that you look uh, at whether these uh, signs of inclusiveness uh, are taking place, uh, whether in the design of your activities you're taking them into account to ensure that where possible you also really reach your target groups. Um, so the first one is, is the affordability of, uh, of what is being offered. Uh, our is the target group financially capable of buying the product or applying the practice? And this uh, does not only have to do with the price itself only. Uh, it can also mean that we'll have to look at more innovative ways of financing the purchase of the product. And we'll go into a bit more depth in that in the best practices. Um, the second one is that the product is uh, or the service is acceptable to the target groups, that they have no objections to buying or using it. Um, and that's, for example, has also a lot to do with cultural norms. Uh, um, does it make sense for this consumer based on his or her beliefs or rituals or habits to, uh, to use the product? Uh, third one is the availability. Uh, um, since we're talking about target groups that are normally a bit more removed from your, your normal uh, centers of activity or centers of economic activity, they are more rural or they don't have the access to the market, it's very important that, uh, that you take an extra effort to make, uh, to make the product or service available to this uh, target group so that they have actual access to it. Um, the fourth one is awareness. Uh, um, target groups should also it sounds very common uh, or plain, but target groups will have to be aware of the product or the service. And, and more importantly, also they will have to understand what it's about and understand its attributes. Um, so if we're talking about uh, uh, bringing a nutritious food product to the market, um, uh, does the consumer understand why uh, actually it's important to, to, to eat or drink these, uh, these nutritious food products? Um, a fifth one we've added to the, to the conventional four A's is the A of advantage that we took from uh, the Growing Prosperity uh, report. Um, since we're also talking about an economic perspective, it's also very important that the target groups uh, understand what benefits they could have from, from using the product or what advantage they could have from the product. Of course, these could be financial, uh, uh, using the product might uh, make it possible for them to generate more income, but it could also be on different aspects, like I mentioned earlier, in the, for instance, in the domain of health. Um, so, so, so these uh, five A's, these signs of inclusiveness, have, be, have played a big role in also looking at uh, the best practices that we were able to identify in the, in the two portfolios. And um, if we're now going to those best practices, um, these have mostly been based on the, on the 10 cases that we, uh, that we have studied in depth and uh, from which also Juliette and later on Foco uh, will, uh, will explain uh, what their projects are, were about, are about and uh, how they relate to these best practices. Um, we've identified uh, uh, seven and I'll briefly go through, uh, through each uh, one of them. Um, the first one is to make uh, access to finance uh, uh, more inclusive. Uh, um, the target groups we are talking about here, um, uh, they are the target groups that are quite often seen as being too risky uh, uh, to provide access to finance to, uh, since they quite often don't uh, have access to any collateral uh, or there would be any other option for, these, uh, for, for the banks or for, for microfinance institutions to see the group as too risky. 
Um, if we just simply talk about an individual loan or individual finance to, to a person from the target group. And we've seen uh, a few options, and they are explained in much more detail in the report, uh, to overcome these, uh, these risks. Um, for instance, uh, uh, to take group loans. So instead of providing a loan to an individual, it would be a group of individuals that's applying, that's applying for the loan, and uh, also then the risk is shared amongst that group. Um, other, other examples are that, uh, for instance, uh, loans are conditional to project involvement. Uh, we've seen from one of the FDOV projects in, in, in Benin, for example, that, uh, uh, that the loans that were provided through the program uh, were conditional on uh, active participation of the target group in, uh, in the project activities, ensuring a certain level of involvement, but also making sure that because they follow the activities, there is also a higher chance of a proper application of the, of the final finance uh, that's being requested. Um, but we've also seen other examples. Uh, for instance, the tailoring of loan products. Um, uh, that's important in the, in, in the water sector, but perhaps even more important in the agricultural sector, where uh, taking a loan uh, to produce a certain crop uh, should take into account uh, the maturity or the, of that crop or the, 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 the cropping cycle of that crop so that uh, um, Repayment times are, are related also to the harvesting times, for instance. Um, there are uh, many more examples uh, of, of this in the report. So uh, please also have a look at this section in, in the report for more detail. Uh, uh, a second one is uh, a second best practice that we have identified that it's very important that projects are able to steer uh, dedicatedly towards these inclusiveness results. It also relates a little bit to my remark earlier on, on M&E and, uh, and the measuring the indirect effects. Uh, uh, getting an understanding of whether your project is also really able to, to achieve these inclusiveness results uh, means that uh, one, you have to set uh, a proper set of indicators for inclusiveness. I have listed a few of the logos in the bottom of the slide of the, the Asian Development Bank, the World Economic Forum, and the Donor Committee on Enterprise Development. And all of these organizations have, 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 have issued uh, dedicated publications where they go deeper into uh, how to set indicators for, uh, for doing inclusive business. Uh, and then secondly, of course, also these indicators should be properly embedded in, uh, in a good m and &E system. And these, the results of this m and &E system should be frequently analyzed. And um, we, we've seen examples of projects where uh, throughout the duration of the project, uh, because of these m and &E results, uh, the, the project approach has been adjusted. Um, there, there are examples, uh, again, from, uh, from, from Ghana in this particular case, uh, where uh, a maze project uh, decided to, to change its, uh, its, the approach in, in, in addressing the female farmers in the communities they were working with uh, because they noticed that the participation uh, of, of women in the activities was extremely low. Um, so in order to meet the requirement of involving at least 20% female farmers, um, they, they changed uh, the approach of their project quite rigorously to, uh, um, to, 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 to achieve this, and they managed to achieve this in the end. And they could not have done that if they would not have had a proper m and &E framework for this. Uh, perhaps the last point, and that's also something that, uh, that Juliette might, uh, might uh, hint at in her, uh, in her presentation, as, as Vera's Investments is also an impact investor. Um, we saw two projects in the portfolio of those 10 uh, where impact investors uh, uh, played an active role or even the lead partner in the, in the PPP. And we noticed that in both uh, those projects, the M&E systems were, uh, were, were very rigorous and, and very specific and also able to measure uh, this inclusiveness. Uh, so that was, that was also an interesting notion from the, from the report. Um, so thirdly, um, uh, tailor activities to specific target groups. Uh, um, so especially if we are looking at the more vulnerable groups within our target groups, for instance, uh, women and youth, uh, um, that might require uh, also uh, developing specific activities to make sure that they can get properly involved into the, into the, into the project. Um, we've seen three best practices or three practices that, that relate to that. Obviously, there are many more, but um, uh, we'd like to highlight these three. Um, first, uh, um, it, 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 it 
not only offers a great advantage to, uh, to uh, involving uh, vulnerable groups into the project, but also to the effectiveness of the project itself, if uh, uh, certain groups are, are involved uh, based on their specific skills. Um, we, we've seen quite a few examples of projects where, uh, where women were involved, for instance, in quality control, uh, because they were simply more accurate and uh, paid more attention to detail uh, uh, than men did. Um, but it's also important not only to look at these specific skills of the target group, but also to look at the other responsibilities that, uh, uh, that, that members from this target group might have. Uh, specifically, again, focusing on, on women and on youth, it could be uh, that women uh, uh, also need to take care of their household responsibilities while also uh, attending to their job. Um, so we've seen examples. Uh, one of the FDW projects in Colombia, uh, uh, where daycare centers were, uh, were installed by uh, one of the corporate partners in the project to make sure that uh, uh, the, the women could bring their kids to the daycare and, and attend to their jobs during daytime. Uh, but you could look at similar uh, uh, activities towards the youth, whereby uh, the project makes sure that the youth can also attend to schoolwork if they are still in school. Um, and lastly, and this uh, relates back to the previous best practice, is that, is that it's, again, it's very important to, uh, to take into account these type of activities in your M&E framework so that you're also sure that what, what you are designing to address these specific skills or to address these other responsibilities, that it's also effective uh, uh, in practice. Um, the next uh, best practice is about uh, capacity building within, uh, within projects. Um, I think it goes for almost all projects in FDOV and FDW that, that, that capacity building, training or, or, or the like uh, is, is a crucial element in, in project and that also substantial budget is, uh, is spent on it. Uh, but the big question, of course, is uh, not only during the project, but also when the projects end, how can we sustain the, the activities in such a way that it is not any longer dependent on, on the budget of the projects? Um, we've, we've seen two good examples uh, of, of, of how that can be done. Uh, uh, first, uh, looking for instance at the Savia project in, in Kenya from the FDOV uh, portfolio, uh, we've seen that the capacity building is largely driven by the two private sector partners in this uh, project, being uh, Rijksvaan and East West Seeds. Um, simply also for the fact that they have a business interest in training the farmers properly on agricultural practices so that they can also make good use of the seeds. Um, since these companies are in for the longer run and, and will also continue to work in these countries when the project ends, um, it's highly likely that these private sector partners will also continue the capacity building activities when the project ends. Um, a, second, uh, a second example, again coming from Kenya, uh, is where we've seen that capacity building is integrated into the curriculum of other knowledge institutes that, uh, that don't necessarily need to be part of the PPP, but operate in close vicinity uh, uh, of that PPP. Um, in the Finnish uh, project, again a project from the FDW portfolio, uh, also here in, in Kenya, uh, there was a close collaboration with the UN University uh, uh, in the same region. And at a certain point also uh, outside of the scope of the project that uh, that university started to implement certain capacity building activities. And, and, and again, it's also likely that such an uh, institute can sustain those, uh, those training activities also when the project ends. Um, next, uh, best practice is about uh, uh, the, using the strength of the broader community. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, it's, 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 you will quickly look at the individual roles that the target group plays, being a farmer or a micro-entrepreneur or an employee. Uh, um, but uh, at the same time, it's equally important to look at, uh, at, 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 at the power of community, as I uh, would want to call it. Um, you cannot uh, uh, fully uh, take the, the individual uh, uh, beneficiary out of the community they are part of. Um, so how can we use that strength of the broader community uh, for the good of the poor and the vulnerable? Um, you could think of integrated approaches where you would make the entire community responsible to a certain public good challenge, uh, such as safe drinking water. A um, good example from the FTW portfolio comes from Malawi, um, where uh, a project on uh, access to safe drinking water did not only make uh, uh, people at the base of the pyramid responsible or involved into ensuring the, the safe drinking water, but also people that were more well off uh, and also the larger users of, uh, of, of water in that community, such as utility companies or 
or others. Um, and because that community approach to ensuring safe drinking water, uh, uh, the, the, the final access for the target group to that safe drinking water was, was much higher. Um, a second one is a community decision making or community consensus, ensuring that not only the, the target group but the entire community is, is involved and agrees with the approach that's being taken. Um, a good example, and I won't spend too much time on that right now, is, is in fact the, the, uh, the, the Building with Nature project in Indonesia that will be explained later on in the webinar by, uh, by Foko van de Groot of, uh, of EcoShape. Um, uh, sixth one and next one, um, and, and it might sound a little bit like an open door, but it is about composing the right partnership. Uh, um, making sure that everybody, all uh, parties involved, are genuinely interested in, may, in, in, in getting to uh, inclusiveness results. Uh, um, we've also seen and what we've heard from a Netherlands Enterprise Agency that also now in the run-up to this new instrument, SCGP, that they are paying specific attention to making sure that these, uh, that these partnerships are really right, that the composition is really right and that they are, are equipped to, uh, to implement a project of, uh, of five years or even more sometimes. And we've seen a few best practices, uh, uh, and this list is not exhaustive, but we've seen a few best practices of how to, 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 to come to a guarantee for such a good partnership. And one is uh, that it's good to have partners that have previously worked together, um, either on the same topic or, or in the same ge geography, uh, but at least that partners know each other before they, they step into such a, well, adventurous, and, but also challenging partnership like, like many FDV or FDW projects are. Um, the second one is that uh, uh, it's important that the lead partner uh, in, the, in the consortium really pursues inclusiveness as part of its core business and that it's fully aligned with the mission of the organization and not seen as a side uh, activity. Um, and thirdly, uh, also very important and also from the interviews, we noticed that some, uh, some projects also lacked uh, uh, attention to, to that particular point is, is a proper involvement of local partners um, that have a good connection with the, with, with the target group, with local communities, uh, and perhaps even more importantly that they, that they have the trust uh, and are respected also by, uh, by those target groups. Um, and then the last best practice um, is about getting uh, the message of the project across and getting uh, the target group also really on board of the project. Um, getting uh, the target group really interested and committed and motivated to join the project. Um, it strongly depends on which levers you, uh, you use for getting them involved and, and, and bringing the message that you have as a project across. Uh, and again, we've seen a few practices that we think can really help in, uh, in, in making, this, uh, making this happen. Um, one aspect, and that also goes a little bit back to the previous best practice, is um, that uh, it's important to make sure that you involve trusted people or trusted organization uh, to voice your intentions, your expectations, and, and in your benefits as a project, because these are the people that are really trusted by, uh, by the communities you're trying to target. Uh, also, another good example that we've seen, for instance, in the dairy project in Indonesia is that uh, amongst groups of farmers that were targeted, uh, a leader or a role model was identified uh, that was also functioning as, uh, as the spokesperson or also the, 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 the person leading, for example, capacity building activities towards that broader group, as that was a person that was being respected and also to a certain extent being uh, looked upon uh, positively as, as he or she uh, is a role model. In, uh, in, 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 in getting good agricultural practices uh, uh, going. Um, two others that are a bit more related to, to communication. Um, uh, one, one is that we noticed well, we should not underestimate that the target group we're trying to address, to, to address uh, uh, might not always be uh, literate and uh, that there are also certain uh, perhaps uh, cultural or, or religious uh, factors that come into play when addressing them. So uh, using simple, lang simple language, uh, trying to use visuals and, and making sure that these also are in line and related with these cultural practices are, uh, are, are very important. We've seen many projects where, for instance, capacity building activities uh, were partly based on, on, on visuals instead of uh, on, on written text, as, uh, as many of the farmers they were working with were illiterate. Um, and lastly, um, uh, also uh, important to create a sense of belonging. Uh, 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 
ensuring a, a sense or a feeling that the target group really wants to get involved in the project. And that could, for instance, be done. And we've seen several examples of that that are also listed in the, in, in the report, uh, where a visual identity was created or a branding was created by the project. And that could take the shape of, uh, of, of T-shirts or it could take the shapes of, of printed bags. But in any way that, that, that people feel that they belong to a certain project or to a certain company or organization. So these have been the seven best practices that we have been able to identify. And then before I give the floor uh, to, uh, to Juliette to explain more about uh, uh, the potato processing project in Ethiopia, um, I also just want to highlight that in the, um, in the report, we've also identified a number of dilemmas. Uh, again, not an exhaustive list, but we wanted to uh, highlight them because we believe it is this is the everyday, uh, uh, these are the everyday dilemmas that uh, the projects uh, come across when they implement their projects. And it's important to understand that uh, we can push for inclusiveness, but at the same time, that might uh, uh, be in a tense relationship with other goals that the project is setting, like having a large scale or being profitable. How do you balance that with, with making the project as inclusive as, as, you, can, as you can make it? Um, so, so for instance, uh, one of the uh, dilemmas that we've seen in, in more in the project design is: uh, uh, Do you go for an approach that is more export oriented, or do you go for an approach that is more local market oriented? Where where are your end consumers? And uh, uh, for both, you can say something. I mean, uh, for export orientation, uh, this is not easy to produce for the export market, but at the same time. Uh, it, it is a source of hard currency uh, for many economies, very important, uh, and, and it can get to scale. Uh, so there, there are uh, reasons why people decide to take an export orientation. Um, but for instance, if you would opt for more of a local market orientation and, uh, and, and target local consumers, um, and that might have a, have a stronger impact on the inclusiveness. Uh, for instance, if you keep food, food products in the country instead of exporting them abroad, uh, that might be a better uh, uh, approach to inclusiveness. Um, then, then also on the, on the activity design, and I think it's something that Juliette will also go into in a little bit more detail in her presentation, but for instance, if we talk about how to deal with small farmers, uh, we've seen a, we see a big dilemma in the, in, in the form of contracting. Um, if you work with small farmers, on the one hand, you want to give them a certain level of, of guarantees that they can supply uh, the company with their products. So you would want to enter into a certain level of what we call fixed contracting. But at the same time, if you make it too fixed, they, they cannot really uh, uh, tap into uh, market developments or they might be, uh, uh, yeah, they might be forced even to, uh, to sell their products to the off-taker uh, uh, in which they are in a contract with. Whereas if you would go more towards a flexible uh, way of contracting, you, would, you might still keep that openness, uh, but there might be the risk of, uh, of, of farmers uh, uh, side selling to other uh, companies and then how do you ensure the sustainability of your project. Um, th there are four other dilemmas that we have listed in the in the report and that we uh, invite you to have uh, to have a closer look at and we're also very uh, keen on hearing your experiences on these on these dilemmas as well so um, that has been uh, uh, the presentation from uh, from my end um, like I mentioned in the agenda we're going to give two uh, uh, project uh, leads of, uh, of one FDOV project and one FDW project the floor now to explain uh, about their projects and um, the first uh, person I'm going to uh, to ask to present their case is uh, Juliette Weikersloot. She's the managing director of uh, Various Investments and Various Investments is the lead in the potato processing in Ethiopia project under, under the FDOV portfolio. So Juliette, I would love uh, to give you the floor to, uh, to present uh, both your uh, your company as well as the, as the project. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I think it's good cool to give you a, a brief introduction on various investments. Uh, this is actually an investment company that sets up projects and invests in companies that have a positive input, uh, impact on food security. And we believe that building the private sector is important to improve food security. And impact and commercial su success can actually go hand in hand if investments are made in the right sector and in the right companies. Uh, Virus has a focus on East Africa and in particular on uh, Ethiopia. Just checking, can you hear me well? Or? Ethiopia in the beginning of 2014. 
Ethiopia is a country that has over 1 million uh, uh, farmers growing potatoes. And the Netherlands is one of the largest potato producers in the world, and therefore has a lot of knowledge on, potato, on the potato value chain, which would enable various to bring that knowledge to Ethiopia. Through our research and conversations, it became clear that the link to the market for smallholder farmers was missing, and therefore investment in the potato value chain was not made. This is how the project potato processing, the missing link in the value chain, came into existence. Now we come to the first slide of the project uh, summary. The key problems that we identified are that potato availability in Ethiopia is low and volatile, despite the good conditions to grow potatoes, which of course is very relevant. Um, yields are only at 20% of their potential and losses, uh, there are a lot of losses through uh, lack of storage and lack of proper distribution and processing. And the second problem is that uh, over 1 million smallholder potato farmers suffer from low and volatile income. A very little investment is made with low productivity as a result. Uh, also, unfortunately, there are uh, a lot of middlemen in the value chain which, uh, which also uh, gain from, from buying and selling these potatoes, which then leads to lower income of the, of the smallholder farmer. The two project goals that we identified are to establish uh, a company involved in potato processing in Ethiopia that would link smallholder potato farmers to the market for quality fresh potatoes and processed potato products and to provide stable offtake for potatoes with consistent prices throughout the season and contracts with offtake guarantees throughout the season. The impact that them then would be achieved would that the company's activities would result in an improvement of smallholder farmers' income mainly, which in turn would start a flywheel for more investment, better quality and more productivity in the Ethiopian potato sector. Next slide, please. So here you see the current situation uh, which uh, smallholder farmers are, uh, are in. Uh, there is uh, very limited access to inputs. A lot of middlemen are, are active in the chain uh, before the potatoes actually come to the end market. And prices are low and volatile due to seasonality. And because of limited investment that is made, the yields of the potato farmers do not increase. Uh, next slide, please. So what these uh, farmers need actually is quality seed potatoes, mechanization fertilizers, and they need stable offtake uh, on the other side to provide uh, them also with storage offtake contracts and, and uh, stable prices, which would then lead to more investments and higher yields. But I think it's important to say here that yields, of course, are the main driver of income increase. Uh, also prices, but yields are, are far more important. If you can double the yields, that, that would lead to, to a lot of increase in uh, Next slide, please. Um, so on this basis, we the uh, FDOV uh, grant in December uh, uh, 2014, and we received positive news that we could start with the project in uh, May to 2015. Uh, at that time, we still had to establish a new uh, company. The company would uh, be named and is currently named Sensilet Food Processing, which means uh, link in the chain, uh, uh, which was incorporated then. Uh, the par partnership was formally set up. Land was secured. And I have to say here that the, uh, the Dutch Embassy in Ethiopia played a very important role there. Uh, relationship with farmers and smallholder farmers and input supply built, and in 2016, the construction of the potato facility started. Then, um, the first potatoes arrived in the battery in the autumn of uh, 2017, and production uh, was ready to start by the end of 2017. Um, and the first products were available in the market at the beginning of this year. So. It's also uh, to illustrate that has been quite a steep uh, um, increase in learning curve, and uh, we are still uh, also uh, we still have a lot to achieve. Uh, maybe here I can also say, of course, very instrumental in this production and, and, and uh, going to the market was that by that time the company had 100 uh, employees. Um, 
One thing here to mention is before I go into the slide that you currently see is that one of the partners of the project through which the small for farmer program uh, would have been organized. And also that would uh, provide seed potatoes, which are very crucial, um, was able to fulfill that role because of the situation that this company was in. Uh, therefore, the project has had to explore new ways to obtain seed potatoes, uh, which uh, need to be multiplied uh, various times before they can actually use the seeds. So you need various seasons to actually be able to provide the seed potatoes to, to smaller farmers. Um, and of course, in this, this period also, the project has had to explore new ways to, to find the right model and work with, uh, with the smallholder farmers. Uh, currently, the project is exploring three models. Uh, one model is uh, a very intensive cooperation with uh, a nucleus farm and that produces the seed potatoes but does not produce final product, final potatoes, and provides then the seed potatoes to smallholder farms and also provides other services uh, to smallholder farmers. Um, and also looks into working with micro entrepreneurs that can also then and, uh, provide services. Uh, the second uh, model that we're exploring is through uh, the cooperation with uh, NGOs. And there are various NGOs that we're discussing. Uh, and this uh, uh, one thing that is also happening at the moment is through. Highlight the potential for long cooperation. These can be just areas in which potatoes are also present, uh, but they can also be <coughs> programs uh, that are already producing other crops. So there are various other smaller programs, and because a potato is a rotation crop for, for other crops, this can also be a very uh, fruitful uh, cooperation. In all these uh, models, um, the project, and more in particular, a particular Ethiopian company, Senselet, is the link to the market. And I think it's, it's important for our, our model. Senselet buys the potatoes, sells, produce them, uh, produces them products, and sells the products in the market. This also means that there's a very strong pool um, and interest for Senselet to source these potatoes, because it really needs the potatoes for this to what I was saying before, is that uh, Senselet is also the collector. Sorry, no. it's also the collector of a lot of uh, knowledge uh, of this uh, regarding uh, potatoes. Um, so that is actually the capacity building point that was made uh, before. Um, further, the project has been working very hard on developing the potato uh, and enabling seed potatoes and other services to be provided to smallholder farmers. And in all of the models, the potato farmers uh, receive training and guidance from Senselet and uh, farm economists on potato cultivation and uh, where the work is actually uh, uh, Wageningen is actually the knowledge partner. Uh, and uh, these training programs have also been finalized and uh, uh, maybe it's good to say that most of these trainings actually take place in the field, uh, but also of course in classrooms. Uh, I think um, I would like to conclude with uh, the fact that a lot of work still needs to be done, uh, but in the first production season uh, 2017, Senselet sourced a large uh, of its potato, majority of its potatoes from smallholder farmers. And this will also be the case, this is also the case for the supply in 2018 to date. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juliette, for this, uh, for this explanation and for the presentation. And I think you've already touched quite actively on, on different aspects of, uh, of the report, such as your interpretation of inclusiveness and also some of the best practices you have uh, implemented and activities you've implemented. Could you perhaps also highlight one, one of the dilemmas you might have encountered in implementing the project in Ethiopia? Um. <clears throat> yeah, I um, uh, I think one of the re one of the subjects that you raised is the fixed farming versus the flexible uh, fixed contracting versus flexible contracting. Um, I think there uh, we're still actually looking into ways 
to, uh, to do more flexible contracting. In some cases, we're already doing that. But what a dilemma is, of course, is that uh, if, you, if you provide uh, inputs to farmers and you provide services to farmers, then um, you would also want at least part of those uh, uh, crops to, to come back. But also pre-finance them, basically, through providing the services. Uh, so we're still looking into that, but we do think part of that part of the yield could go uh, through other uh, other channels. On the other hand, of course, there may be quite an interest to to uh, for those farmers to, to sell to to Lucas Farm, for example, because they know what the prices are and they don't have to to take care of distribution to to the market themselves. So I yeah. think this is one of the dilemmas that you're raising. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for illustrating that. Thank you. I, I think there might be some questions that people have, and I would, uh, I would once again, uh, I want to invite all the participants to put uh, uh, the questions that they might be having in the in the Q and A box in the bottom, and we'll I will address a few of them at the end of this uh, of this presentation. Um, Juliet, thank you very much uh, uh, for now, and um, uh, we'll go to the we'll go to the next speaker. Um, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, he couldn't uh, uh, make it. Uh, uh, to be uh, to be present during the webinar itself. In fact, uh, he is having a full day consortium meeting exactly with this uh, with his building with nature project uh, today. Uh, uh, so probably he'll discuss within his partnership a lot of the uh, a lot of the, uh, the things we're discussing right now. But it means that he could not present himself. Uh, however, I've I've recorded uh, a video uh, uh, interview with him, and I'd like to show that right now. Uh, to all of you as a substitution for his, uh, his own presentation in this webinar. Oh, I might have to do things a little bit differently. Sorry, name was low. Uh, yeah, starting to record. Yeah, I said can record. Okay. Okay, my name is uh, Fokke van der Groot. Um, I work as an environmental engineer for uh, Boscanus, a marine contractor. But uh, most of my time I spent uh, working for uh, the EcoShape Foundation. And the EcoShape Foundation uh, is where the uh, uh, knowledge program Building with Nature is, uh, is run. And uh, this program focuses on, uh, uh, on the change we see in the, in the world where we, um, uh, where, we, where we try to include um, uh, the benefits of nature and society um, into uh, hydraulic infrastructural developments. Uh, and this is needed because um, uh, we see that uh, until so far, most hydraulic infrastructural works focus mainly on, on one purpose, uh, single purpose solutions. It's either economical development, coastal safety, uh, 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 transport and navigation. Um, and, and due to the changes we see in the world, like climate change and uh, 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 um, societal uh, inclusiveness, we see that these single-purpose solutions um, are no longer sufficient uh, and, and, and are not, not, no longer able to deal with these uh, changes. Here you see a couple of examples, the Mississippi Delta, uh, Jakarta Bay, uh, and in the Netherlands, uh, the Marke Meer. Um, where uh, hydraulic solutions um, uh, fail um, in the long term, um, and this and this needs uh, this calls for a transition. Uh, so rather uh, than, than building in nature, uh, building a, a structure in nature and compensate uh, the impacts uh, elsewhere, uh, we are focusing on, on knowledge development. How you can uh, construct hydraulic infrastructure. Um, uh, by using the force, the force of nature, uh, and this has several benefits. Um, uh, 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 and one of the benefits is that uh, in the in the long term, uh, you can develop more sustainable uh, developments um, that not not only impacts negatively impacts the environment, but also uh, includes um, uh, positive impacts from from nature. And by doing this. Um, we try to include natural processes in our hydraulic infrastructure. We want to inc make them integral and flexible, so they are adaptive for long-term changes in the, uh, um, in the surroundings, for example, like climate change. Um, and they meet the economical needs and give nature an impulse where this is possible. 
uh, and these infrastructural developments are uh, they only work if they are put on a, on a large scale uh, fitting the surrounding landscape uh, and, and, and most one of the most important uh, aspects is also that they are integrated as part of a total uh, set of measures and actions and that they are um, developed in cooperation with the uh, local communities and local society. Um, a key aspect of this is that, uh, that this knowledge development on, on building with nature and hydraulic infrastructure works is done uh, together with all parties involved. So this is uh, uh, this includes basic fundamental knowledge developments on the scientific level, uh, working together with universities, working together with companies that are able to build these uh, uh, these infrastructural developments, such as marine contractors. Uh, but also engineering, engineering firms, engineering consultancies. Um, work together with NGOs. NGOs have a fundamental understanding of how societal processes work, lo uh, work with uh, local communities. Um, and this is all integrated at, uh, typically in, in governmental policies, so you need to work together with, with the government. So rather than having a, a linear process, um, where the governments start to, to, to identify a problem and then in, in the end companies try to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to build it. Uh, we try to set up a, a community uh, from, from companies, knowledge institutes, NGOs and governments working together on, on solving these, these problems. Um, and so far we have set up, in the past 10 years, we have set up a large uh, a, a, a set of uh, projects where we have tested several building with nature concepts, uh, mostly in the Netherlands. A few of them are uh, are, uh, are abroad, and one of these pilots is uh, is set in Indonesia. Uh, and I would like to focus on that project uh, a, a little bit more. Um, the project is located in uh, in Semarang. Uh, Semarang is located on the north uh, shore of Java, uh, central Java. Um, and northeast of that area, there's a, a, a large um, agricultural uh, land called uh, province called the Mak, um, and where this project, uh, where this uh, location used to be uh, focusing on, uh, on agriculture and rice uh, rice production, in the past 20 years, um, the local economy shifted from uh, from rice to agriculture. And by doing so, the mangrove belt was uh, was removed, and the mangrove belt formed a natural barrier to protect the hinterland. Um, and we saw that uh, by, by by removing this mangrove belt, uh, and a sort of an erosive process was um, initiated. And in, in in about ten years, the coast eroded uh, a couple of kilometers inland, um, and this caused caused a massive uh, massive amount of flooding. Uh, roads being uh, removed, houses being flooded on a daily basis, um, and the government tried to implement basic uh, hydraulic infrastructure works uh, to solve these issues, but these traditional single-purpose solutions uh, uh, basically all failed, uh, mainly because they are not, cost, not focusing on tackling the root cause, which was uh, unsustainable land development. They only focused on um, uh, protecting uh, the hinterland from from water, uh, and this this didn't uh, this didn't work, and and eventually made the, the situation worse. So what we did is we we together with the NGOs, together with uh, local governments, together with the companies, engineering firms, and, and uh, marine contractors. We focused on an inclusive, uh, holistic approach where we included all uh, root cause issues that are have caused these main uh, main problems. So focusing on the physical part, focusing on the uh, ecological and biological processes, but also uh, and probably most importantly, focusing on the social issues that form the root cause of these problems. So may I um, may I ask you also there, uh, um, looking at uh, building with nature, what what does uh, a concept like inclusive mean to uh, to a project like building with nature? 
uh, sorry, what inclusiveness means in, in building with nature? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, this is shown here uh, on, on this slide. The inclusiveness um, forms the basis of, of, uh, of the solution here because uh, the, 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 the erosion was caused by the unsustainable land use and the unsustainable land use was a result of uh, lack of knowledge how you should maintain a, um, uh, a, a natural system um, that's, that pr protects your land and your daily li uh, your, your livelihoods. Um, so what we did, we've, um, we've set up coastal field schools. Uh, we've tried to include local communities and local stakeholders in these coastal field schools. And together with these communities, we've set up a, uh, a community group where, uh, where, where the local, uh, local farmers were, uh, were grouped and trained in how to apply sustainable agriculture and sustainable protection of the mangrove green belt. So here you see all the, the different farmers that were uh, grouped in our in our project, uh, and they and all these farmers saw that something had to be done, some something had to change, and they are willing to invest in changing their uh, the way how to apply agriculture. Uh, there are basically three types of uh, of. Uh, of agriculture applied in this uh, in this region is either traditional uh, agricultural uh, uh, works. These are the, the blue ones, and we've tried to rev revitalize these agricultural pots into sustainable agriculture. We've got the yellow ones where the farmers change their ponds into mixed mangrove agriculture, where, where mangrove trees are applied in these uh, in these uh, in these ponds. And along the coast, we have the, uh, the ponds that are um, uh, basically given up um, and they are being transformed into mangrove uh, uh, zones again. So these will form the, uh, the natural uh, protection for the hinterlands. And we've shown by applying sustainable agriculture that the production uh, increased uh, up to three to four hundred percent. Uh, and with these additional benefits, additional uh, profits, uh, farmers were compensated to apply, uh, to give up the land and apply uh, mixed mangrove and mag mangrove uh, greenbelt, uh, uh, basically uh, restoration in the ponds. So the community groups are taking care of their own transformation of their own agricultural, sustainable agricultural system. Uh, and this and this approach uh, is called uh, the biorights mechanism. And this, I think, this forms the basis of our inclusiveness program, where the communities uh, uh, are are trained to apply sustainable agriculture in combination with applying uh, sustainable coastal safety measures. Thank you for coded. Uh, the, that's very interesting. Could you also say that that's one of the um, uh, the best practices? Uh, how, how would you describe this as a best practice, and what could other projects learn from it? Um, well, while looking at the best practices mentioned in the in the report, I think um, for building with nature in general, and and also specifically for this project, is that the um, uh, is the collaboration. Um, at a very early stage with all the stakeholders involved. So it's like it's the, it's the, the public private partnership is the key to apply building with nature um, in general. And also in this case, that working together uh, with, uh, with companies, with engineering firms, with contractors, um, but together with the NGOs, um, I think forms the um, forms the basis of the success of our project, um, and, and uh, by doing so, we've we've applied, uh, we have access to a wide range of, of knowledge, from the physical system to the ecological system to societal system, and they should be uh, uh, they should be included in the holistic approach um, to uh, to um, implement building with nature. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 
And so um, uh, there must have also been uh, some dilemmas in the uh, in the implementation of, uh, of the project, and for instance, in uh, in balancing the uh, the the attempt to uh, make the project as inclusive as possible with other uh, goals of the project. Could you could you elaborate on one dilemma that you have experienced? Um, well, for building with nature, uh, also uh, it's a, it's a generic problem, uh, generic challenge. Uh, but also here is that um, a, a, a natural a solution based on the on the natural system takes time for for them to see the results. So it's not a it's not a quick fix. So it's an investment in the long term, and you have to be uh, 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 you have to be able to convey that message continuously, and able to keep the communities on board. Um, show that it works is is really important for a a, a new in, innovative solution, um, and I think it has been a challenge for us to uh, to keep convincing them that this is a, uh, a solution for the, for the long term. Uh, they've always uh, invested in, um, uh, they've only invested until now in, in short term solutions. And they see that the situation has become so bad uh, that this is no longer an, uh, an option for them anymore. Um, but investing in, a, in an innovative new solution that it takes time to develop is, uh, yeah, is definitely a, a challenge for us. Okay, this has been the, uh, this was the interview with, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with Foco. Um, that also makes that we're going into the final uh, phase of uh, this, uh, this after, of this, sorry, this, uh, this webinar. Um, and that's the, that's the questions and, uh, and the answers. Um, unfortunately, Foco is not a, a, a here and present and, and able to answer questions, but of course, Juliette is just as allies and, and myself. Um, you've uh, been uh, sharing quite a number of interesting uh, questions with us in the Q and A box, and um, we uh, uh, we took uh, three questions that we uh, um, that we were going to answer. And uh, uh, perhaps it's best to uh, to, to first uh, address the questions that uh, that are addressed to Juliette. Um, she said, uh, basically, uh, um, I, I might be able to combine the questions. Uh, um, there was one question on uh, who carries the production risks in the project. Um, that's one, and, and perhaps slightly related to that, um, uh, I can imagine that in the project there are quite a number of uh, collection and input provision activities to ensure uh, that both the inputs come to the farmers and, and, and the produce is being collected. Um, that might now be partly subsidized by the project. Uh, how will this affect the profitability for the small the farmers uh, when the project ends? Is that are these questions you could you could give us an answer to? Yeah. So the way we set up the project is uh, like uh, like I introduced in the in the beginning, is that it it is uh, in the end uh, should work commercially. Uh, so uh, the way it is set up is that, uh, for example, uh, distribution services intra-farm, because of course there's various services, yeah? so there's services in the farm and also uh, from the farm then to, to, to the production facility. But in principle, these are included uh, in the price. So. Um, if the nucleus farmer provides certain services to the smallholder farmer, he will he will withhold uh, a little bit from the price that uh, that is paid uh, for himself. Yeah, so in principle, these activities training is, uh, is 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 subsidized, of course, because these trainings are provided. Uh, but but the input services are are not uh, are not subsidized. Okay, and, and, the, and, and the question related to the production risks? Yeah, with production risk, uh, of course, the production risk is in the end always with the farmer. Uh, I think that that's the case uh, everywhere. And currently, uh, what is happening, of course, is because we go through a learning curve. For example, uh, the price that we paid for the first uh, harvest was uh, we increased a bit because you know there was uh, some learning still to be done. But this should never happen in the long term because also there, in the end, uh, the smallholder farmers in price should be able to compete with, uh, with, other, uh, with other farmers. So that's the way the, the, the project is, is, uh, is set up. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juliette. Um, uh, there's also another question that I would like to address to, uh, to Ella. Uh, Ella, one of the uh, participants also asked uh, uh, whether it's actually a criterion for, for a lead partner in, in, for instance, in this particular case, in SDGP, to have inclusiveness uh, as, uh, as, as core business, or how important is this to, to uh, an instrument like SDGP? Okay. Well, in assessing the proposal for SDGP, we will look at various uh, aspects. So, we, at first, we'll look at the complete partnerships and all the partners involved in the project. And then we will look at sustainability um, and the long term impact of the project. Also, sustainability beyond the project duration and the scalability. So, what happens if this project works out well? What will happen after that? Will it be scaled? Do we really believe that it will be scaled? But again, we will look at the complete partnership um, and whether we feel that it fits with the interest of the different partners to really reach the objectives as framed in the project proposal. Now, for sure, if we see that the lead applicant is a business and it's more easy for that business to uh, market its producers to the high-end markets, then the, uh, it will be much more important to have a safeguard that the project does look at the bottom of the pyramid and at the uh, bottom of the pyramid consumers and not at the midterm of high end, uh, mid end or high end consumers. That can be done because of the lead applicant, because it's really sincerely its interest to, um, to focus on these other LTBUP uh, markets, but that can also be taken up by other partners to have this safeguard and to really tailor this project towards the target group, yeah, which is important for the STP. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ella. I think that, um, uh, that, that, that answers the question. I think uh, a last question before we, uh, uh, we close off this webinar, also uh, looking at the time and the fact that we have already passed the hour. Uh, um, the last question that we'll handle is, uh, is, is related to the uh, to the community to the aspect of community before i will answer that question um uh, i would like to explain to you that we are going to collect all the uh, uh the different questions that have been answered and that uh, have been posed and that we were not yet able to answer in this particular session and we'll make sure that also written answers to that uh, questions are uh, are shared with you as well so um, uh, your question will address be addressed even if it's not in this particular webinar um, so, so perhaps a final question that, that was also uh, raised was, why is it so important to, to involve the broader community? Is this, should this really be a goal? And I think it, 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 it also shows from the research that it does not necessarily need to be uh, a, a goal to, to involve the entire community. It, it will depend strongly on what type of uh, uh, approach the project is taking or what type of goal uh, the project is setting for itself. I mean, if we listened earlier to uh, to Foco's uh, presentation on on building with nature, there it becomes quite clear that that, that, that the challenge that is to be overcome, uh, a better management of the of, of the water delta, is uh, is something that uh, that is a responsibility for an entire community. Uh, uh, and, and then obviously also the the approach should be strongly focused on on the on the broader community. Uh, a, a similar uh, uh, example is, of course, the, the example I mentioned earlier of the, of the, of the Malawi uh, uh, project, uh, the FDW project, where, where also uh, uh, the, the access to safe drinking water uh, is something that could only be organized together with the entire community since, uh, since some of the target groups were heavily affected by the heavy water use of some large water users such as utility companies and others. Um, so if the, if the goal of a project is that broad, uh, uh, I believe it's very important uh, to, have, uh, to have a community approach to your project. But also if the project uh, approach is, is less broad than that, uh, uh, still I think that, uh, uh, that there is more power in, in tapping into a community than, than is quite often seen by project. And that is something that perhaps is overlooked or, or, or is not sufficiently paid attention to. So, so looking at community, no, it's, it's not a goal in itself, uh, but I would say it's something that, uh, that should be carefully considered when, uh, when designing an project. Um, 
on that particular load, note, I would like to uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your participation in this uh, in this webinar, and thank you, Juliette, for uh, uh, for your presentation on uh, the potato processing in Ethiopia project. Uh, thank you very much, Ella, for the for the introduction uh, uh, to this uh, webinar and uh, and answering the questions. And even though he's not uh, here at the moment with us, also Foco, thank you very much for for your presentation on on building with nature. And of course, the last but not least, uh, I thank you also participants for uh, for actively participating participating and posing your questions and uh, I wish you uh, a pleasant afternoon and uh, this will be the end uh, of the webinar.